Um, so, I guess now the, the speaker is, is Daniel, who, whom you might know because yesterday he was the chair of the first session, and tomorrow he will give an invited talk. So I'm looking forward to seeing what happens on Thursday, you know, with him. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, now, now he will give a, a, a talk on uh, learning uh, thermal phases of matter. Um, so, please, Daniel. Thanks, Alvaro, for the introduction. Um, so this is uh, joint work with Emilio Norati, who I think is also somewhere. Emilio, Emilio is there. Uh, and uh, Cambiz Jose, James Watson. Uh, Cambiz and Emilio from, from Munich and James Watson from, from Maryland. Uh, you can find the, the work uh, this is based on on the archive, same title as the talk. So, oops, okay. Um, so in this work, we are mostly concerned about uh, learning Gibbs states uh, from from samples. So you know you should think uh, Gibbs states. They they find various applications in in optimization in all areas of science. And it is usually the case uh, that there's some sort of phase transition in how difficult it is to simulate uh, these Gibbs states as you decrease the temperature. Um, however, you can actually, when it comes to learning them, at least classically, so if you're given various samples from, from Gibbs states, you, you, can, you can learn the underlying state and the underlying Hamiltonian. So this is by now well known in, in the classical world. However, in the quantum world, there are still many things we don't understand that well in the, uh, about learning quantum Gibbs states. And in this talk, I will mostly be interested um, in what can be done if we are given log n samples. So if you have n qubits, I want to see what, what properties of these uh, Gibbs states we can actually estimate uh, in the setting where the number of samples we have scales logarithmically in, in, in system size. And we'll consider two different settings. So uh, in one of them, this is more the traditional setting of, of tomography, where you're given uh, multiple copies of the same state, um, and you want to infer some, some classical representation of it. Um, and in our case, we'll make the additional assumption that this is uh, the Gibbs state corresponding to some local Hamiltonian. Uh, and the second setting we're going to consider is that of what we call learning thermal phases of, of matter. So this is very much inspired by some work by, by Richard and, and co-authors where they consider the setting where you're not necessarily given uh, copies of the, the same state, but like a whole family of, of states here. So here they're indexed by this, this, uh, these parameters X. Uh, and you don't want to really learn something about one state, but rather this, this whole family of states which are parametrized by, by X. And again, all we want to do is in this polylog N copies regime. So uh, I'll quickly discuss first this first um, uh, setting where we are given copies of the same state, and then I'm going to move on to the, the one of the, the phase. So, um, Yesterday, we had this uh, nice overview of, of shadow tomography, and we all love shadows. Uh, they are very versatile, efficient storage, classical computation. Um, and you know, if you want to, for instance, estimate all marginals of a fixed size of a quantum state, then you can do this with log n samples, which is uh, sort of in the spirit of what I want to do. However, um, if you want to uh, look at how the sample complexity scales in the size of the support of the observables you care about, there's an exponential scaling there. So in practice, even with shadows, you cannot really recover uh, observables that are supported on huge uh, parts of, of the system. Um, and another thing is that is also, of course, an advantage of shadows in most settings is the fact that it doesn't require any assumptions on the underlying state, but it also cannot uh, use the fact that you might have some additional information, for instance, that it corresponds to a quantum antibody state to reduce your sample complexity. So, um, and so on the other hand, there are also the, the various Gibbs learning, uh, sorry, Hamiltonian learning protocols. For instance, there is this very nice result by Anshu et al. Uh, where they show how to learn the parameters of uh, corresponding to a Gibbs state efficiently in the, in the sense of, of sample complexity. Um, and in this setting, they really require you to have some sort of, of Gibbs state. It is a very simple protocol in the sense that you only need to, to measure some few body marginals. 
Um, however, this, uh, these uh, Hamiltonian learning protocols, they require a polynomial number of samples. And actually what they do is not to learn the, the state, but rather the, the parameters uh, of, of the Hamiltonian that then generates the state. So it's, it's a different figure of merit. Now, uh, in our work, uh, we consider then uh, a different metric which is related to the so-called quantum Wasserstein distance. So um, to introduce this distance, uh, which uh, De Palma and co-authors came up with, uh, first have to introduce the notion of a Lipschitz observable. And roughly speaking, Lipschitz observables are those observables such that if you fiddle with one of the qubits, if you just apply, let's say, a one local unitary, the expectation value of the observable won't change much. So like local changes cannot change, like local operations cannot change the expectation value a lot. So these are Lipschitz uh, observables. And this Wasserstein metric uh, quantifies how well you can distinguish two states based on these observables that are somehow stable to, to local perturbations. And it has some very nice properties. So for instance, you can show continuity bounds for entropies in terms of the Wasserstein distance. And if you have just a sum of few body observables, this, uh, although the operator norm is usually like of system size uh, order, the, the Lipschitz constant then is of order one, like constant. And we then propose learning the states in this metric uh, because it turns out that if we use our good friend the trace distance, even for, for product states, to get an estimate up to epsilon of, of, of the underlying states, you need a number of samples that is polynomial in system size. So if we, if we work with the, the usual metric, namely the trace distance, we won't be able to do anything interesting in this polylog uh, N regime. However, if we are happy with this Wasserstein distance instead, um, then, then we can actually show that it is possible to recover uh, these, these Gibbs states up to uh, total variation, uh, sorry, Wasserstein distance epsilon n with, with log n samples. Um, and uh, to do that, we, we follow uh, an approach that Kambiz and I uh, worked out in a previous paper which is to use a tool from uh, Optimal Transport uh, pioneered by Marton uh, called Transportation Cost Inequalities. So if you're familiar with um, Pinsker, for instance, this is just a, a variation of Pinsker where instead of having the relating the trace distance and the relative entropy, you relate the, the Wasserstein distance and the relative entropy. However, these inequalities are significantly stronger. They imply a lot of strong properties for the underlying states. And unlike Pinsker, they don't hold for, for every state. Uh, they are just known to hold for, for very particular classes uh, of, let's say, high temperature Gibbs states or commuting states and so on. Uh, and this was a major barrier of applying these methods to more general classes of states. And in this, uh, work, we uh, overcame that, that barrier by proving what we call a weak transportation cost inequality. So usually these transportation cost inequalities, they, they relate this, this Wasserstein to the relative entropy. Um, and, but now we call it a weak transportation cost inequality because we allow for an error term that is uh, vanishing as, as epsilon uh, goes to zero. So we, uh, this sort of inequality doesn't get you all of the nice consequences of the usual uh, transportation cost inequality, but for, for this learning application we had in mind, it works well. And we need to make two assumptions on the underlying class of states. The first one is uh, the sort of exponential decay of correlations. So we need to assume that these many body states um, um, have correlations that decay exponentially in the distance in the system. And another thing we need to assume is the so-called uniform Markov condition, uh, which um, is another form of exponential uh, decay of correlation, but this time in terms of the conditional mutual information. So we need to assume that this sort of conditional mutual information 
also uh, decays exponentially in system size. And um, these assumptions uh, don't hold universally, and it's very hard to actually show that they hold, but at least for some classes of uh, high and low temperature states, uh, and uh, for instance, for all commuting models or things in, in 1D, we can show that uh, these assumptions hold. So then we also obtain these uh, weak transportation cost inequalities for such systems. Um, and then put together with some uh, results on estimation of uh, quantum Gibbs states based on maximum entropy methods, uh, we can then show that you can estimate quantum Gibbs states in this Wasserstein distance with a number of samples that only scales logarithmically uh, with the size of the system. And why should you care about that? Why is like estimating this Wasserstein distance interesting? Well, it means that uh, the, the state you recovered uh, will, will more or less have the same entropies as, as the original state for observables, which are like sums of few body things, like energies and things like that, the, the two states will agree. So, you know, it won't, they won't agree on all possible observables you can write down, but they will definitely agree on more, let's say, physically motivated um, things. And on top of that, uh, the number of samples you need to recover, let's say, uh, information that is contained on local patches of the system will also scale polynomially on the size of those patches, which is uh, exponentially better than using shadows on their own, which have this exponential scaling I mentioned before. So somehow um, we have this uh, polynomial scaling in the in the locality, but I must also say, of course, that we make very strong assumptions, these, these, these exponential decay of correlation sort of assumptions. And on top of that, uh, at least for this version of the algorithm we have so far, unless you're applying it to commuting states, the post-processing will be exponential in general. So that's definitely an important open problem, I, I guess, in general, to get more efficient uh, ways of estimating these, these GIP states for various applications. Because at least for commuting, we know it, it, it's efficient. Now, um, moving on to this, this other setup I mentioned at the beginning of, of learning phases, let me just uh, recap some, some previous work. Um, so in this paper by Huang and others, um, they consider the following setup. You have some family of Hamiltonians. Uh, they are parametrized by some, some X. And you know that these are gapped Hamiltonians and they are geometrically local. And what happens is that you get some, some X, which corresponds to one of the Hamiltonians in this, in this phase. And you, you then are given access to a copy of the, of the ground state, okay, corresponding to X. And your task is somehow to be able to do a few runs of this uh, setup and then afterwards uh, get some uh, estimator for let's say local observables or entropies or things like that uh, for the whole class of, of states X. So you see a few values of X and then you're supposed to infer something about all the possible X, right? So this is, this is the sort of uh, setup they were considering. And uh, it's quite remarkable that you can actually do this. Uh, so, and moreover, you can do this with efficient storage and classical computation. Um, but in, at least in this, this previous work, the, the scaling in the precision with which you want to recover, let's say, local observables was exponential. The, the sample complexity was also polynomial in the system size. And again, I, I really want something logarithmic. Um, and it worked for, for ground states of gapped systems, so not necessarily for uh, thermal states. And um, the, the recovery was on average. So they could not say that like for, for a given X, like how, how good is my estimate? Just like taking the expectation over the, the parameters. Um, and you know, this, this sort of, uh, the, especially the the the, um, the scaling and the in the precision meant that 
it, unless you take a huge amount of samples, you only get like very few body observables in practice. And uh, in this work, we, we addressed uh, these issues. So we extended the results to um, uh, GIP states, and uh, we have worst case recovery guarantees. We have uh, an exponential improvement in the precision. So it's, it's still uh, quasi-polynomial. It's not uh, polynomial yet, but it's, it's already better. And um, we, we also extended it to, to uh, GIP states. And I should, of course, mention that uh, in parallel, uh, the more or less very similar group of people as the first paper also had a second uh, paper, which is, which is great, uh, was presented at QIP, um, which, which also has, has similar results, but again, mostly looking at uh, ground state properties. Okay, so what is the philosophy uh, behind our, our algorithm? It turns out that um, if you consider, for instance, gap state, uh, ground states of, of gapped Hamiltonians or most uh, physically motivated Gibbs states, they will have these sort of exponential decay of correlation properties I mentioned before. And it turns out that if you have exponential decay of correlations, you have another thing called local indistinguishability. So uh, what is local indistinguishability? Um, if you take um, the, you look at some area of your system, let's call it S, and then you look at the reduced density matrix uh, around uh, a radius of this S, uh, and you consider two different Gibbs states. Uh, one of them is where you, you took the, the, your original parameters x, and the other one is where you just take the, the parameters x on this enlarged region, and you just kill all the other entries. You just set them to zero. And it turns out that the, these two will become exponentially close to each other, like the reduced density matrices, uh, as you increase the radius around, around this region. Um, and um, we, we also consider, uh, so this is what co is called local indistinguishability. And um, like we also consider variations of this in the paper. So like not all phases you might want to uh, consider have this property, but I let's just consider the case of local indistinguishability for now. And um, what, what we then do is the following. We show somehow that um, under local indistinguishability, the, the if you want to recover the, the density matrices locally, right? if you only want to care about local information, then it doesn't matter too much what is going like outside of S. So if the parameters inside of, of this region are close, then it doesn't really matter what's happening outside. The reduced density matrices will be close. And we are then able to adapt the original uh, proof of the, the shadows protocol to show that if you're given shadows, not necessarily of, of the same state, but states that are in some sense close to each other, at least locally, then the whole thing still, still goes through. So it, this is some sort of like non-IID version of, of the, the shadow protocol where you're given things which are not exactly the same, but kind of close. So this is the, the first proof we, we use. Sorry, the first tool we use. Um, and then we just uh, use the following algorithm to learn over these, these whole phases. So let's say you um, the first thing you do is you sample a lot of these points from, from this phase, so point x1, x2, x3, x4. You generate a shadow for, for each one of these points you're given. You store the corresponding parameters and shadows in your, in your classical computer. And then after you've done this uh, a lot of times, I'll tell you how many times in a second, but it's already there. Let's say you want to then uh, estimate for some value of x you haven't seen before, the expectation value on some region A. What you just do is you just go back to the list you had before and you look uh, for which values of, of, of the samples the, the, the parameters on A look kind of similar 
to this point y you want to recover. And then you just do the, the shadow estimate on these points you've seen before. So essentially, you just collect enough points so that you've covered the whole space locally. And this is then sufficient to sort of recover um, the local expectation values. Um, so all we need really is just to collect enough samples that so that we can see what is going on in the whole space. There is no, so previous results really require tools from machine learning and things like that. We don't require any machine learning tools. It's more sort of a concentration of measure problem because we essentially show that it's all very local. It only depends very locally on, on the parameters and you just need to collect as many points so that you can see everything um, locally. So we just run some sort of uh, coupon collector analysis on this problem um, and then get this, this sort of sample complexity for the uh, whole face. And with that, uh, I'd like to conclude. And uh, as I mentioned, there are a few important problems, namely, for instance, how do you actually run the, the first bit I mentioned on learning the Gibbs states in a computationally efficient way? Um, and well, you know, uh, we make some strong assumptions on the sorts of states we are considering, and it would be nice to, to relax them in general. And uh, with that, thanks for the attention. Thanks, Danny, for the talk. Uh, questions? Um. Thanks for a great talk. This is probably something you mentioned I just missed, but with the Gibbs tomography, mm -hmm. what is the output that you are like getting that characterizes the state? Oh, okay, so, uh, right, I should have been more explicit about it, sorry. So essentially what you get is like you get some x hat, so you get the parameters of some other Hamiltonian, and once you consider the corresponding Gibbs state, you have the, the promise that they'll be close in this, this metric. So you get, you get a set of parameters for some Gibbs state. Okay, and the parameters, like the, the set of Hamiltonians that I'm choosing from contains the, Gib, the Hamiltonian that prepared the official, the, the yes. official. So it's kind of like, it's like a Hamiltonian learning problem mm -hmm. as opposed to a state tomography thing. Well, you know, yeah, so but I mean, at the end, we're interested in the state that is just, so we, we don't, right. so uh, usually in Hamiltonian learning, you want to have a promise that like this X hat and this X are closed in some metric. That's, I don't care if they are very far away. All I want is that the the states that you get once you look at the corresponding Gibbs states are close in this Wasserstein sense. All right, thanks. Oh, actually, one one more small thing: the Wasserstein distance you have down there has an n in the sigma in the in the theorem. Oh yeah. So, right. So um, you unlike the trace distance, you're happy if you have a Wasserstein. So. Trace distance epsilon n is useless, right? It's just between zero and one. Wasserstein is actually between zero and n. And if you wanna, for instance, uh, get a relative error, so let's say you were looking at an observable like sum of Pauli z on each qubit, like this will have a, an order like n, right, typically. So a Wasserstein epsilon n, then we'll say that you make an error of order epsilon n. So like for extensive observables, this is a good recovery guarantee. Um, so actually, I have a question. Uh, so you mentioned you proved this uh, weak uh, transportation inequality, mm -hmm. which is enough for you. So in what way, uh, okay, so I guess two questions are kind of the same. Mm -hmm. uh, what does it give you, well, so how is it different to the usual one and what does it give you and what does it not give you? Right, so the usual one uh, is this one. So you see that it just has like the Wasserstein and the relative entropy. Mm -hmm. Ours has this extra term over here so it's like an additive error term. Um, and the, the, the main application of these inequalities is to prove concentration. Uh, and uh, this weak transportation cost inequality, as far as we know, is useless for concentration. Because that's going to be an exponent of a turn of bound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so for this more traditional yeah. application of concentration, this is useless. Mm -hmm.
Uh, more questions? Uh. Uh, have you thought about the uh, optimality of the uh, tomograph uh, Gibbs state tomography protocol? That means if you want to estimate some state uh, with absolute accuracy in virtual stand distance, how mm -hmm. many copies do you need to mm -hmm. implement this protocol? Yeah, so that's a great question. I should have also put it on the. Uh, so for we we can show that for for product states, the the sample complexity we have is, um, I mean, okay, we we can't get the log n, uh, but uh, so yeah, I I think we don't we don't have good matching lower bounds, and what I think that would be even more interesting is to get lower bounds when you don't have, for instance, exponential decay of correlations. So you say uh, have a system with long range correlations uh, and try to understand whether you can, for instance, infer all of the extensive properties of this thing uh, in, uh, in this log n regime. So I think that that would be very interesting, get lower bounds whenever um, like exponential decay of correlations doesn't, doesn't hold. That would be very interesting. Oh, thank you. Um, actually, I have more questions. <laughs> yeah. um, so, so you uh, you mentioned earlier the there's other um, results about learning Hamiltonians from Gibbs states from mm -hmm. uh, from Anshu and also from um, uh, Ha and so on. Mm -hmm. So, in your learning algorithm, would you be able to use these algorithms uh, also? W well, uh, yes and no. So, so the 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 um, we are really interested in in learning the the coefficients of the Hamiltonian mm -hmm. in infinity norm uh, whereas in the Anshu they they are looking at the L2 norm and why, why is that uh, uh, why do we want infinity yeah. um, no we don't I just said something wrong sorry <laughs> uh, <laughs> no actually so the, the no the whole reason uh, why we don't want to use the the Anshu one is that um, no matter what norm you're you're using they can only get non-trivial recovery guarantees in the poly n um, samples regime so and we are interested in the log n so uh, um, you know if if you're not if you don't have poly n samples the 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 uh, like anorak's result doesn't give you anything mm -hmm. so that's why we can't directly okay. use it mm -hmm. but whenever you have like a Hamiltonian learning um, result that can say something non-trivial in the log n regime which is the case of the result by ha and others um, then, then we can import it. Okay. Uh, maybe one last question. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you mentioned that the, con the the transportation inequality is equivalent to the Gaussian concentration, mm -hmm. but can you go back the other way also, and you know, just from concentration of your Gibbs state, mm -hmm. uh, work out that you have all these learning properties and so on. Yes. Like so if you have, if you like once, what so. Um, uh, for instance, there there is a nice paper by Kuvahara and Saito where they consider um, concentration inequalities for long-range quantum uh, Gibbs states, mm -hmm. and but not for for all possible observables, just some very particular observables. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there are also some issues with the well. I, okay. Uh, uh, so if you once once you have any sort of bound uh, on, on the concentration for a class of observables, you can usually rewrite it in this way and, and, and get some learning results mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, thanks. Um, any last uh, quick questions? Uh, yes. Okay, if not, let's thank uh, Daniel. Thanks a lot.